To make this pump example into a more practical example, we need to add a little more hardware. This is a reentrant entry here. We've got the pipe sticking out into the lake so that it's not right at the edge, not sucking up as much sand. We'll need some valves to be able to shut things off. There'll be a valve there. We'll probably want another valve over here. And at the outlet of the pump, we really should have a swing check valve. That's a valve that'll prevent the flow from going backwards through the pump in case the pump turns off. Once we pump stuff up to the top of the hill, if we just shut off the pump, we don't want it to all flow down the, down the hill again backwards through the pump. Now, we need to put some numbers on our elevation change. Let's assume we're going up by 40 meters. And the total length of the pipe, let's say it's 120 meters long, so not too far. We've got some elbows here, a couple of 45 degree elbows, and we're moving water. So we have a kinematic viscosity of about 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second, and a density of about 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So when we go to solve this kind of piping system, the first thing we do is uh, make sure that we enumerate all of the little minor loss elements in here because although we call them minor losses, they may actually turn out to be quite a large part of the equation. So, suppose we've got one globe valve for control, and that will have a K factor. I looked it up, and it'll depend on which table you look in for which particular brand of globe valve, but I got a value of 10. We'll have two gate valves, uh, maybe another one up here at the tank to make sure that nothing flows backwards out of the tank. So two gate valves as shutoffs. And they're about 0.2 as a K factor, or for two of them, a total K factor of about 0 0.4. So much lower loss across a gate valve because it just opens wide, basically pulling a gate back out of the pipe than through a globe valve, which has got much more convoluted passages. We've got a swing check valve here. And its loss coefficient is somewhere in the middle, round about 2.5. This reentrant entry and reentrant means that the pipe sticks out past the wall of the uh, reservoir here, that reentrant entry will have a K factor of about 0.8. And if we've got two 45 degree elbows here, they'll be maybe a total of about 0.35, assuming that we have long radius elbows. Finally, the exit up here, we lose all of the kinetic energy, so the K factor is equal to 1 for an exit no matter what shape the exit profile is. And if I sum all of those up, I wind up with about 15.0. So we know how long this pipe is. We know what the K factors are. We need to know how big a pipe it is. Well, let's say it's a medium-sized pipe. It's a 6-inch Schedule 40 plain carbon steel pipe. Now, to know what that inside diameter actually is, we'll have to look it up in a table for Schedule 40 pipe. And I looked it up, and I found out that the inside diameter of a Schedule 40 pipe is 154.1 millimeters. Or, being careful to keep everything in consistent units, 0.1541 meters. The roughness for a plain carbon steel pipe will be something around 0.05 millimeters. So about 1 20th of a millimeter, quite a, quite a smooth surface. So from that we can get the relative roughness, that is how big is the roughness compared to the diameter of the pipe, and that will turn out to be 0 0.00032. So three parts in 10,000 for the roughness height on the inside of the pipe. So that's a pretty smooth pipe. Now we've got a piping system here. 
and I picked that six inch pipe as probably being okay to meet my design flow rate of about 0.1 cubic meters per second. Now 0.1 cubic meters per second may seem like a small number. It's a fraction of a cubic meter per second, but that's actually quite a large flow of water. 0.1 cubic meters, that's 100 liters every second, or in units that you'll see fairly commonly, 1,585 U.S. gallons per minute. Now, I'm going to try always to write U.S. gallons per minute, but very often you'll see just simply gallons per minute on the assumption that we're talking about U.S. gallons and not imperial gallons. So if we want to figure out what's going on here at the design flow rate, then we'll need to find out what the velocity is so that we can get the Reynolds number and it's going to be Q divided by the cross-sectional area. So that'll be 0 0.10 divided by pi d squared over 4. The diameter here, make sure it's in meters, and I'll get 5.36 meters per second. So that's not an atypical velocity for a liquid in some piping systems. If I plug in for the Reynolds number, which is the velocity times the diameter divided by the kinematic viscosity, I'll get about 83,000. And if I then go for the friction factor, which is a function of the Reynolds number and the relative roughness, and I can go to, Moody to the Moody diagram for that, or to Colebrook's equation, or a variety of, of different ways of getting that calculation, I'll get a value of 0.016. So that's a typical sort of friction factor that you'd see in a lot of practical engineering applications. We're going to see numbers round about 0.02 or a little lower, 0.016. Probably good design going on here. So the delta H for the system, as we saw before, it's going to depend on delta Z. There would be delta P, except in this case we've got atmospheric pressure at both these surfaces plus F L over D plus sigma K all times V squared over 2G and this is how we would have tackled the problem in the in the section purely on piping so that'll be equal to 40 plus if I take F times L divided by D I'll wind up with 12.5 plus 15 for the sum of the loss coefficients times V squared 5.36 from up here over 2 times 9.81, the value of G. And if I plug all of that through, I'll wind up with 80.27 meters of water as the head rise that I would need across that pump in, over to, in order to overcome the 40 meters of elevation difference, the friction along the pipe walls, and all the minor losses in each of these little fittings along the way. So let's look at that for a moment. This delta H cis, the work that I'm going to have to get the pump to do to raise the head across the pump, it's going to be 40 plus 12 and a half plus 15 times the V squared over 2G is going to give me about 80.27. So about half of that is overcoming the elevation and doing useful work. And the other half, roughly, is going into losses. Losses due to minor losses in fittings and also the FL over D element due to friction losses along the pipe wall. And they're splitting, well, not quite half and half, but similar. So remember that minor losses are not necessarily the smallest losses in the system. They're not negligible. They may actually account for just as much of the loss as the friction on the pipe wall. Now, how do I translate that into a pump system uh, head requirement based on the flow rate? Well, I could go back and make sure that I got the V squared 
transformed into a flow rate, or I could look at the overall total here. Now I could say, well, delta H cis has got to be equal to 40 meters, and it's going to have to overcome that 40 meters of elevation no matter what the flow rate is. And it's going to be another 40.27 meters of water. 40 subtracted from 80.27 gives 40.27. And it's going to depend on the flow rate squared because we've got V squared over 2G here. So if I multiply that by whatever flow rate we have as Q squared and divide by the flow rate that I used in this particular design calculation, 0 0.10 squared, then that'll allow me to have this relationship for the pump head required by the system in terms of Q squared for Q that varies in the general neighborhood of the design flow rate that I've been looking at. So this is Q squared over Q reference squared. This is scaling up only the minor losses and the friction losses by the difference in the square of the flow rate. If I draw myself a graph of this, flow rate, delta H for the system, then I'll wind up with here's 80 and here's 0 0.1. So that's the one data point that I calculated here. That's 80.27 at 0 0.1 cubic meters per second flow rate. If I draw my graph, well, when I get to a flow rate of 0, I'm still going to have 40. And if I plot this parabola in between those two points, I'll get something that looks, oops, curving up like that, something like that. So that relationship there, that is the 40 plus 40.27 divided by 0 0.10 squared times Q squared. And that allows me to figure out how much head rise I'm going to require across the pump for different flow rates. Now let's check ourselves on this. I said before that I was going to be able to treat K and F L over D as constants, but in fact F will change. If I've got a lower flow rate, then the Reynolds number is going to be lower and the friction factor will actually be higher. So let's check on that one. If I took V equal to 5 meters per second, I'd find that I had a friction factor equal to 0 0.016. If I had V equal to 10 meters per second and did the same calculation, I'd find I had a friction factor equal to 0 0.0156. So very close. And if I went down to a much lower flow rate, a much lower velocity with a velocity of 1 meter per second, I'd find that I had a friction factor somewhat higher at that lower Reynolds number of about 0 0.0184. So our assumption here that the friction factor is constant is not quite correct, particularly not if I try to project it way back to here. However, if I stay up here in the region around the design point, then that approximation that the friction factor is constant won't be too bad. Now, if we're doing our calculations on an exam or a paper problem like this, then we'll just assume that this friction factor is constant. If we're doing our calculations in a spreadsheet or other computational system, then we can easily go back and redo this calculation here to get a different friction factor and find a slightly different relationship for the system head versus the flow rate uh, when we do it computationally because we've got the horsepower to get the numerical results correct. But the key thing to recognize is that the amount of head rise that you're going to need across the pump is going to increase parabolically with the flow rate starting from a value 
equal to whatever head rise we require to overcome elevation and pressure differences. So somewhere along this curve, we're going to match up between what our piping system requires and what our pump can deliver. And that's where we're going to go next, is looking at what the pump can deliver and see where those two intersect.